This video is about a man who made waves everywhere he went. If you can imagine an aspect of the Roman Empire, then you'd better believe this man left his mark upon it. From political upheaval to religious overhaul, coinage to conquest, Constantine, not unlike Keanu Reeves, was a figure history will never likely forget. Unlike my last video on Emperor Hadrian, I'm not really going to get into whether or not Constantine the Great was really all that great, or the question of how benevolent or Christian or polytheistic he was. Instead, I'll detail his incredible rise from childhood, through his time as a political prisoner, to his time as a general, to ruling the empire. And I won't lie to you, this is probably going to be a challenge. He went from sort of ruling one quarter of the empire to consolidating the whole damn thing during his life, and throughout it, ran one of the most effective propaganda machines since Veni Vidi Vici. Not to mention the fact that his adoption of Christianity means half his biographies hail him as a saint who could do no wrong, while others criticised him for his abandonment of Jupiter. Eusebius, his biographer and Bishop of Rome, disclaimed at the start of his life of Constantine that Tolei ne paxion tithes tu anthros makariotetos aporon tun geni. I am not capable of saying anything worthy enough of this divine man. Nevertheless, I have waded through a library's worth of Constantine's censorship and criticism to bring what I hope is a pretty impartial overview of the rise to power of a man who I'd say on balance deserves his epithet of the great. But first, some backstory. Thirty-seven years before the birth of Constantine, 235 CE, the Roman Empire went through what we call the Crisis of the Third Century. Like many crises, it began with a political assassination. When the Emperor Severus Alexander was killed by his troops, it led to nearly 50 years of civil war, rebellions, invasions, plagues, economic turmoil, and the eventual division of the Empire into the Gallic, Palmyrene, and Central Roman sub-empires. In short, the empire had gone to shit. But in 270, everybody's fan favourite emperor ascended to power. Deus Aurelianus, the divine Aurelian, lord of the Roman meme. Amidst this utter chaos, he rose from humble origins, training every day with spear, bow and sword. During his meteoric rise to the ranks, he earned the nickname Aurelianus Manu Ad Ferrum, Aurelian sword in hand, a soldier to his core. As some excellent videos have shown, which I'm sure many of you will have seen, Aurelian powered through the declining empire like a machine, proceeding to reunite the three divisions, fix the economy, and turn back the tide of barbarian invasions. For this he was hailed as Restitutor Orbis, the restorer of the world. Sadly, he too was assassinated, which meant the crisis, though substantially subdued, was not over yet. It also brought about a bit of a paradigm shift in who became emperor. Unlike the early days where emperors would choose their heirs and the empire would accept them, the claimants now tended to be confirmed based on military ability, not necessarily political. Now it's worth saying here that the empire had been technically split when in 283 CE, the great emperor general Carus bestowed the title of Caesar upon his two sons Carinus and Numerian. The former to look after the west, while Carus and Numerian fought the Sassanids in the east. At this point, Carus was titled Augustus, while his sons were the Caesares, the Caesars. When Carus died, allegedly struck by lightning, Carus and Numerian became joint Augusti. When Numerian died, on his way back to Rome from Persia, enter Diocletian. He was the commander of the cavalry of the Emperor's bodyguard, and like Aurelian, had risen through the ranks from humble beginnings. His troops swiftly proclaimed him Augustus, and he moved within the year to eliminate Carinus in 285 CE at the Battle of the Margus. The ascension of Emperor Diocletian to the Purple marked the official end of the crisis of the 3rd century, and a new form of empire was born. You see, Diocletian seemed very aware of what had caused the crisis and decided to formalise the co-emperor model which had been in use on and off since Marcus Aurelius. He knew the stress the empire was under was dangerous to manage with a single emperor, and so in 286 CE appointed his lieutenant Maximian 
Po Augustus, ruler of the West. Diocletian called himself Augustus Jovius, i.e. Jupiterian Emperor, and Maximian Augustus Herculius, the Herculean Emperor. Diocletian would be the more senior of the two, looking after big picture policy, while Maximian, Hercules, would be the strongman military power in the West. This model wasn't unlike that of Sparta, in which the Agiad king would be more senior to the Eurypontid king. More about that in my video on Leonidas' early life before his stand at Thermopylae. But Diocletian went further still, when in 293 CE, he formalised the office of Caesares as official successors and junior emperors to the two Augusti. The first of these Caesars were Constantius in the west and Galerius in the east. This was the start of the Tetrarchy, the rule of four. And with that background out of the way, we can get back to Constantine. Constantine was in fact the son of Constantius, who, as we've just discovered, would become one of the first Tetrarchs. I'll try to enunciate these names clearly because they can get a bit confusing, and just be glad I'm not covering Constantine's sons in this video. Constantius originally served in Aurelian's elite guard, so he too was a capable soldier and general. It was likely while campaigning with Aurelian that he met the Greek Bithynian woman Helena, who despite her poor background became his wife, or to some sources his concubine, and she gave birth to his son, Constantine, in 272 CE in Naissus, or modern day Serbia. So what of this young Constantine? The writer Sextus Aurelius Victor wrote that from childhood he had been driven by a prodigious and powerful genius, burning with a desire to command. Apuero ingens potensque animus ardore imperitandi agitabator. Just going to put a propaganda alert in here so we don't get too starstruck just yet. Now it's unclear if Constantine and his mother were with Constantius during his campaigns, but being the son of Constantius, who at this time was a rising star in the military, it's expected that Constantine had a pretty good upbringing and education in both Latin and Greek literature, oratory, military tactics, physical combat, and the rest of the cultural curriculum. But alas, when Constantine was around 17 years old in 289 CE, a year after his father had been given the prestigious rank of Praetorian Prefect under Augustus Maximian, Constantius left Helena and married Maximian's daughter Theodora, likely in a bid for future increased power. Certainly it worked, and four years of campaigning against the Germanics later, he was appointed one of the two Caesars. At this point, Constantine was sent to the court of Diocletian in Nicomedia in the Eastern Roman Empire. Why? Well, partly to ensure he had an even greater exposure to the highest levels of Roman power, but also so Diocletian could keep Constantius in check, a hostage situation if you will. Constantius was an impressive general, and so naturally a threat. In his tenure as the more senior Caesar, Constantius demonstrated his military ability par excellence, removing a Roman usurper from Gaul, defeating Franks and Germanics, brutally annexing Britannia from rebel and Frankish forces, and finally suppressing a picked invasion across the central belt of Scotland at the Antonine Wall. Meanwhile, Constantine, back in the east, was expanding his intellectual interests, perfecting his Latin and Greek political wiles, and more importantly for later, mixing with Christians as well as devotees of the Pantheon. Clearly intelligent, he would likely have been developing an ideology of his own already. He also entered military service at this time, fighting under Diocletian and the co of Galerius against European barbarians and Persians from Syria to Mesopotamia, being promoted to Tribunus Ordinis Primi, Tribune of the First Order. This position sounds more impressive than it was, being one usually reserved for the young elite to gain military experience, but nevertheless only the most prominent of these young men tended to attain it. He campaigned for at least five years on the Roman borders. Towards the end of his time in Nicomedia, he was exposed to the vicious Diocletian persecution of Christians, who, although they had been discriminated against as a disruptive minority before, was suddenly, in 303 CE, subject to attempted total elimination. Churches were razed to the ground, holy writings burned, Christians demoted or enslaved, and even burned alive under Galerius during most of his time as co-Caesar and later co-Augustus. As for Constantius' involvement as co-Caesar, the sources are mixed. 
The most holy biographer of Constantine, Eusebius, says he did not partake in the persecutions at all. The more partial Lactantius, who may even have tutored Constantine in Nicomedia, said this. Constantius ne dissentire a maiorum preceptis videretur, conventicula, id est parietes, qui restitui poterant, dirui passus est. Verum autum dei templum, quod est in hominibus, in colome servavit. Constantius, not to be seen disobeying the commands of his superiors, allowed the destruction of the churches, i.e. the walls, which could be rebuilt, while he preserved the true temple of God, which is in mankind. It's unclear how much of a persecutor Constantine himself was at this early stage, and it's frankly too hard to say, what with the propaganda machine and all. In any case, he remained with Diocletian on campaign, building an immensely favourable name for himself over the next two years. And then, on the Ides of December 304 CE, the Emperor Diocletian very nearly died. Just over three months later, upon the convenient arrival of his vicious Caesar Galerius, Diocletian in Nicomedia and his co-Augustus Maximian over in Milan announced their dual resignations. Constantius and Galerius were now the Augusti. But the question of who became their Caesars was a decision still up to Diocletian. And who did he name? Well, anyone who put money on the favourite would have lost it, because instead of the promising young Constantine, son of the great Constantius Augustus, and another tried and tested man of Roman valour will come too soon, the new Caesars were far more disappointing. Lactantius says Galerius aggressus est Diocletianum assailed Diocletian, pressuring him into selecting the Caesars of his own choosing. Galerius, qui orbum totum iam spe in Vaserat, who had already set his sights on the whole world, would want Caesars he could control far more easily. When Diocletian ascended the platform to announce his decision, all eyes and excited soldiers looked at Constantine, their victorious officer, before turning, in disappointment, to the men Diocletian eventually draped in the purple. Galerius's drunken friend, Flavius Severus, and his loutish nephew Maximinus, the peasant-born half-Roman nicknamed Daza. It was around this time Constantine knew he was in trouble. Galerius despotically sent him on suicide missions in attempts to eliminate him, and the future emperor knew he had to get out. The Christian biographers say he fled Galerius's court because he was being persecuted for his already firmly held Christian beliefs, propaganda alert, while the pagan writers claim it was simply to escape assassination. Whatever the reason, the Liber di Caesaribus makes it a very epic chapter in his saga. Fugae commento cum ad frustrandos insequentes publica jumenta, qua qua iter egerat interficeret in Britannium pervenit. He fled to Britain, destroying all forms of public transport in his wake to stop his pursuers. Now this was a very long way to go, and he must have hurt a lot of very poor horses on top of the carnage in his wake to get there in the time he did. He reached his father at Bononia, Boulogne-sur-Mer, that same year in 305 CE. They crossed the channel there together and headed to Ebercorum, York, to wage war on the Picts in Scotland. Unfortunately, Constantius died a year later, but his military legacy was so revered, and his men now so favourable to the impressive young Constantine too, that they pledged themselves to him as Augustus in 306 CE. This not only meant he had bypassed the established system, bypassed the rank of Caesar, but it also meant he'd bypassed the will of Galerius. With the regions of Gaul and Britannia pledging themselves to Constantine, the enraged Galerius nevertheless feared his military power and popularity, so begrudgingly offered Constantine the rank of legitimate Caesar. Constantine accepted, for now, and sacrificed illegitimate Augustan power for real Caesarian power. Severus was formally promoted to Augustus. This infuriated another spurned player in this ever more dangerous political game. Maxentius, the son of former Augustus Maximian, again confusing names here, had, like Constantine, also been passed over by Diocletian, again because Galerius did not want him in power, despite being his father-in-law too. Maxentius revolted against Galerius, claiming the title of Augustus for himself and taking command of Rome itself. Son-in-law or not, Galerius couldn't tolerate this and sent the Augustus Severus to defeat him in battle. Severus, the drunk, failed, being captured in the process at Ravenna. 
This left the Tetrarchy with one legitimate Augustus, Galerius, two legitimate Caesars, Constantine and Maximinus, and one illegitimate rampaging Augustus, Maxentius. This led to chaos on the Italian peninsula. Severus's troops had previously served under Maxentius's father Maximian and now defected to his rebelling son. This naturally attracted the attention of Maximian, who went to Constantine's court in Gaul to discuss the possibility of forming an alliance against Galerius. It was then, in the year 307 CE, Constantine consented to the alliance by marrying Maximian's daughter, Maxentius's sister, Flavia Maxima Fausta, proceeding to officially recognise Maxentius as a legitimate emperor. This resulted in Maximian returning as Augustus, equally recognising Constantine now as the other Augustus, with Maxentius and Maximinus Daza as the Caesars. Rather than dive into the conflict, however, Constantine continued what he had started upon being proclaimed emperor by his troops. He stuck to governing his provinces and consolidating his borders through a series of successful campaigns with the barbarian tribes. Eusebius claims he overpowered them all, subduing them from savagery to civility. His military success against Rome's enemies, while not getting involved in the civil war at this point, earned him many accolades. Eusebius also said, and of course, propaganda alert, he so far surpassed his peers in Roman might that his peers were terrified of him. Rome de eschuos to suton e pleonecti tus homelicas hos cae foveron av troisinae. He subdued Picts, Germanics and Franks, doing his best to appear a benevolent leader to his people. He couldn't stay out of the civil conflict for long though when Galerius called a council of the Tetrarchs in 308 CE at Carnuntum in Austria. With the assembled rivals and all of their armies present, including old Diocletian, they finally arrived at a very tentative resolution. With some promotions and demotions, four tetrarchs were once more established. Galerius and his friend Valerius Licinius would be Augusti, while Maximinus Daza and Constantine were Caesares again, the Caesars. But as soon as Constantine returned home, he rejected the demotion and continued styling himself as Augustus. But don't blame only him for the troubles which ensued though, Diocletian's solution to the crisis of the 3rd century was falling apart. Everyone seemed dissatisfied with the Council of Carnuntum's outcome. Maximian, the now two-time Augustus, had fallen out with his son Maxentius in Rome, and after fleeing to Constantine again, decided to fight him too now, in 310 CE. Constantine, who had been warring against the Franks, chased him with his armies to Massilia, modern Marseille, and an old Greek colony. Rather than fight him though, the city simply let him in, and Maximian killed himself. Around this time, Constantine shifted his narrative as a legitimate tetrarch, and embarked on his quest to rule as single emperor over the entire empire. Instead of Jupiter and Hercules, he identified with Apollo and Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun, who would be the blazing light to bring Rome back to peace. That year, Galerius died too, leading to the outbreak of war between Maximinus Daza and Licinius, the Eastern Tetrarchs. Meanwhile, Maxentius was terrorizing Rome as a despotic ruler. Punishing those under him with cruelty and brutality. He'd also set his sights on Constantine, ostensibly for killing his father. He declared war in 312 CE. Playing the game, Constantine allied with Licinius as a safeguard. And with that, throwing caution to the wind, he mobilised against Rome. Constantine moved through the Alps, conquering city after city with a creative variety of successful military tactics. By October that year, Constantine had nearly reached the walls of Rome, where Maxentius was holed up for a siege. It was here that one of the most famous stories in Constantine's life was said to have taken place. While marching, Iden en torano stulon fotostavroide, en ogramata en legonta, en tuto nika. He saw a pillar of light in the heavens shaped as a cross, on which letters spelled out, with this, conquer. 
Another narrative says he actually saw the Greek letters Chi and Rho in the symbol which would soon become known throughout history. In any case, cross or letters, Constantine had the Cairo symbol put on every soldier's shield, the first two letters of Christ's Greek name, Christos. I'll be honest here, something I didn't know until a cursory glance at Wikipedia told me was that Constantine wasn't the first to use this symbol. It was used by Ptolemy III, well before the common era or the birth of Christ, to present the first two letters of the word Christos, meaning happy, auspicious, or prosperity. Now, facing off against Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge across the River Tiber, Socrates Scholasticus says Constantine, Prusastai Romaius tes tu efton dulias espudazen, pushed himself to liberate the Romans from their slavery under Maxentius. It was an outstanding victory, ending with Maxentius drowning in the river under his own retreating soldiers. The people of Rome welcomed Constantine with open arms. Constantino de Gaihere he vasilia prosumus kai chairusa prosechoresen. The imperial city rejoicing gladly accepted Constantine as their ruler, said Praxagoras of Athens, quoted by Photius of Constantinople. So now Constantine has Rome. And I've got to say here, I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't honest about how he ruled. First of all, one of his major changes was his eradication of the Praetorian Guard, a Roman force which had been troublesome in the past, to say the least. Quorum odio Praetoriae legiones ac subsidia, factionibus septiora quam urbi Romae sublata penitus. The Praetorian legions and their auxiliaries, who deserved all their public hatred, those who would sooner rebel against than safeguard the city of Rome, were completely disbanded. Not a popular bunch at this point. A pagan writer also said, Commodissimus tamen rebus multis fuit. He was very reasonable in the way he ran things. Nutrire artes bonas, praecipue studia literarum. He encouraged fine arts, especially literature. Legere ipse, scribere, meditari, audire legiationes et querimonias provinciarum. And he himself read, wrote, considered, and listened to ambassadors and the requests of the provinces. But behind the scenes, another tale emerges. Fuit vero ultra laudis auidus. Hic Traianum herbem parietirarium ob titulos multis aedibus in scriptos apelare solitus erat. Certainly, he was very obsessed with achieving fame. Due to all his inscriptions across Roman monuments, he took to calling Trajan the wall plant. I won't lie, it sounds like he might have been a little jealous. So it seems as though he was accepted as a good ruler by Christians and polytheists alike, but unsurprisingly for such an indomitable character, it seems as though he had a bit of a god complex. This might be on brand for one of the old emperors, who literally were gods, but perhaps clashes a bit with his later Christian image. Anyway, there are now only three tetrarchs left, Constantine, Licinius, and Maximinus Daza still hanging onto power. Licinius and Constantine revivified their alliance with the marriage of Constantine's half-sister Constantia to Licinius. They also officially signed into law the Edict of Milan, granting full religious tolerance of Christianity across the empire in 313 CE. It was then that Constantine converted to Christianity, becoming the first Roman emperor to do so. While they were in Milan, Maximinus invaded Licinius' land, so the latter went back and defeated the former. Now, there were only two. And with just two Augusti, the prospect of power went to Licinius' head, and allegedly tried to have Constantine assassinated. The two came head to head in 324 CE at Adrianople in Turkey, where Constantine again emerged victorious. The undefeatable Christian emperor proceeded to chase Licinius and his shattered forces into further skirmishes until September that same year, when Licinius finally surrendered at the Battle of Chrysopolis. Licinius was exiled, but in 325 CE, Constantine eventually had him killed. All rivals were defeated, no further claimants to the broken tetrarchy were left. The Labarum, with its emblazoned Cairo, stood in every province of the empire. 
In 326 CE, Licinius's remaining family were killed, and Flavius Valerius Constantinus ruled a once more united empire.